So every year we have Davos. Every year inequality is said to be high on the agenda, while policymakers and business people sip champagne in an exclusive ski resort in Switzerland. And every year the rich are getting richer. Before the meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos that ends today, Oxfam released a report on the share of wealth. It shows that the gap between the very rich, the super rich, and the rest of the world continues to widen. Last year, the richest 1% owned a 48% of global wealth. It's expected the 1% will own half of the world's wealth by next year. That leaves the other half for 99% of adults on this planet. Someone who's passionate about this subject and has been speaking out globally is former cabinet minister and labor leader Jay Naidu. Jay is the current chair of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. He's just returned from discussing inequality at an event held by Oxfam and the University of Oxford. He joins us now. Thank you for joining us, uh, Jay. So, so let's start with Davos uh, because last year an explicit theme was inequality. That seems about 2014 now, um, but it's, it's still on the agenda, inequality. Do those people uh, gathering their care and, and do they actually have the power to, to make these major changes that, that um, Oxfam has been calling for? No, I don't think we must overestimate the importance of Davos. It's a, it is a meeting place of extraordinary powerful people in the business sphere, in, in governments and including in, in civil society as well. But it's an, an opportunity to exchange ideas, look at risks and trends for, for the year and the future, but it's not to e create an implementation plan. Of course, they hold very powerful levers of power in the economic and political and social sphere. So one hopes that coming out of Davos, that there would be a commitment, which can only happen within the country. You know, at the end of the day, people experience poverty and inequality or the lack of basic services at a local level. Mm. So we need, in fact, the role of our governments to be at the center of challenging inequality. And for a lot of people in the world, especially the next generation, they are losing confidence in the government to be the independent arbitrator between the marketplace and the, the interests of citizens, because increasingly, this group of 1%, the billionaires club, are using not, not just getting richer, they're getting more powerful politically because a lot of our governments have these huge election campaigns and they end up taking money from these powerful people who have an agenda to try and make sure that their governments are lobbied to allow them to accumulate even more wealth. This is so interesting because in South Africa we say that there's distrust between business and, and government and that's the source of our woes. But globally, is there actually an incestuous relationship uh, between governments and business people? Um, the, the Oxfam report was very interesting because they were looking at Ebola and how pharmaceutical companies spent uh, so much. In fact, they spent the most, but uh, it was nothing compared to how much they spent lobbying the, the US government. Oh, absolutely. I mean, let me quote Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is the fourth richest man in the world. And what he said in an interview on CNN was that for the last 20 years, there's been a class war. And my class has won, he says, because he was arguing that the rich should be taxed. And in fact, Warren Buffett and many of uh, individuals among this 1% say there should be more taxation on the super rich because they're accumulating money at a much faster rate than is normal. In fact, they've become even richer since the economic meltdown and collapse, which in a sense was caused by the human greed of the Wall Street bankers and, and, and these investors that have put money with them to generate the profits that have made them more and more powerful and more and more richer. Is it a, a global problem or a national problem, like you were saying? Because you've mentioned Warren Buffett and, and the tax. We also know that corporations are evading tax. And, and that seems to be perhaps um, maybe one big thing that, that we can tackle as, as a globe, uh, clamping down on, on those loopholes that the likes of Google and Amazon are using and saying that that tax will be equitable for companies and individuals. It is a global problem. It cannot be tackled country by country. In fact, President Mbeki chaired a, an inquiry into how much we lose in Africa, and he estimated around $50 billion per year is lost because of tax dodging. 
So these figures go into, into the multi-billions globally. And so it needs an international response because you know, a country that sets itself up as a safe haven and a tax haven needs to... Like Mauritius. Like Mauritius, On like the United Kingdom is also a tax haven. The, one of the largest concentrations of these billionaires is in London. So it's not just in the developing world. Even in the developed world, you have these tax havens that basically companies are able to use a whole sort of financial transactions and transfer pricing to make sure that they're not taxed on what they earn within a country. So it requires a global response. I think increasingly since the crisis, even developed countries are saying this should be on the agenda. But I still see an absence of political will. And that can only be done at a political level to have that political and financial controls on, on, on people paying fair taxes. Because that is the role of government in terms of his redistribution role, so that the needs of people are met. So what we have happening, which is ironical, a crisis caused by the illicit and often criminal activities of very powerful people in business, created an economic meltdown. Millions of ordinary workers are thrown into the streets without jobs, and then the governments bail these companies out using tax money and then imposing austerity cuts on the public sector. So ordinary people like us, our children who have less access to quality education or to social services or to social protection. And this is what's happening in the world. And that's why the next generation is losing trust in the whole system. The political system, if you take South Africa's statistics, 31 million people had the right to vote, 25 million people registered to vote, 18 million only exercised that vote. It shows that the next generation is losing confidence in the legitimacy of the freedom that so many of us and so many people in this country fought so hard for, because it's not meaningful for them. They don't have a pathway of hope and of opportunity that addresses their needs, and all they see is growing inequality powerful people, people who are politically connected, getting tenders where there's no delivery. So I think that we're in danger in a very fragile state at a global level. This has other implications, perhaps, because if I was sitting there as a wealthy person, you, you may start to think, if governments don't spend taxes wisely, it's better that we're allowed to keep the wealth for, for future generations, that we are allowed to invest in companies that create jobs and things like that. Um, and maybe we can bring up an article, the, the two richest men last year, they, they say made $21 billion. Now, Bill Gates is giving billions away. So, so could you argue that, that here's a man who's helping to generate wealth, then give it away. Warren Buffett is also there, who you have said is, is talking about tax. Should, should we encourage this sort of activism among the wealthy themselves, or do you see a future where you don't allow people to amass the sort of wealth that these two have? I think Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Mo Ibrahim, uh, you know, Nick Hanover, who is a Seattle IT billionaire, who said, we've got to have a minimum wage in the United States because people need to buy things and they're not, wages have not risen, real wages have not risen in the United States. So he was arguing that there should be a minimum wage. And he said, his article was titled, The Pitchforks Are Coming After Us. So I think there is awareness among a certain part of that super rich club that is conscious that this is, this is not sustainable in the long term. The second thing is that a system, and that's why we have to come to the system, a system that does allow individuals to accumulate so much. Because it is not true, it is, it is economically incorrect to say that because you have billions, that there will be more jobs. Because what the evidence and the data is showing us is that a lot of that wealth is sitting in this casino economy globally, and it's not generating jobs. It's actually playing the casino on the basis of a very convoluted system of financial mechanisms. So it's not going into creating factories and jobs, and Europe is experiencing that. If you look at Europe today, the unemployment amongst young people in southern Europe is close to 60 to 70%. It's the same as what we face here in South Africa or in the rest of the developing world. Inequality is not just rising between people in the north and people in the south. Africa has 16 billionaires living alongside 358 million people who are living in extreme poverty. So what we are saying is that inequality cannot be good for economic growth. 
It cannot be good for social stability. It could not be very good for there being political stability. And what we see in South Africa today, even the explosion in our townships of xenophobic attacks, is directly linked to the fact that people feel blocked from opportunity. And so that translates in a, in a context where the leadership is so weak and there's no political will to tackle the problem into violence becoming a language. And this is what we've got to address, that inequalities today is being seen by ordinary people who are living in townships without basic services, and the increasingly these young people without hope or opportunity are getting angry, as much as we were angry when apartheid stole our human dignity. Is, is it a, a perception that it's getting worse? And I know Thomas Piketty has argued that it's getting worse. Uh, but if we bring up a, a graph from Oxfam, it looks like that that 1% um, owning 48% of the world's wealth is where we were in 2000 anyway. So things got a little bit better. Um, and then we, we've kind of got back to an equilibrium. Is, is the trend getting worse or is this just a problem that, that's been around for a while? Well, it's been a problem that's been growing. In the last three decades, that's what's been growing because when the Berlin Wall fell, what increasingly became the political ideology was the market will solve all our problems. There will be a trickle down and eventually people's needs will be met because allowing people just to accumulate and taking away a lot of the regulations on the banking sector and different sectors will create this explosion of wealth that will be miraculously shared with everyone. It's a lie. That the fact that the government failed to act to control human greed, which is a natural human instinct, ended up with an economic meltdown, with a food crisis, with unemployment that is today entrenched. And I do not think that we are addressing the structural issues that are leading to inequality, to poverty, to climate change in the, in the world, and to increasingly a new apartheid that I say, apartheid that is dividing people on the basis of class. And that is rising as rapidly in our own countries in the South as between the North and the South. So, so what are those structural issues? We've spoken about tax uh, dodging. We've spoken about people who are allowed to accumulate incredible wealth, but even if you put a maximum salary, they can still do that through companies and things like that. How do you actually go about addressing this? Well, I think, first of all, we've got to tighten up the law and the regulatory environment at a global level. Secondly, we've got to tax companies on the basis of where they earn their revenue. And then thirdly, I think what we need is a minimum wage. We need wealth, the best way to share wealth is a minimum wage, and making sure there's a social security net across that catches people that don't have a job. Mm. But I think that increasingly we've got to make education, for example, not just access to education. It's great that South Africa has achieved the MDG for enrollment. The question is, what is the quality of the education? Is it training people with skills that they can go and build their own livelihoods? Because we are living in a new world today. And this new world is the technological and knowledge revolution is in fact more powerful and has a bigger impact than the industrial revolution. We have changed the way our societies work, how we access services, how we define work itself. But we're still training people to go and look for jobs, whereas we should be training people to try and create their own jobs and create their own businesses. Then we have to ask, and I ask myself the question, in the 80s, during our freedom struggle, we had tens of thousands of small black businesses in NAFCOC and FAPCOS. Where are these businesses today? Why don't we support them to become medium businesses and big businesses? So today when we talk about South Africa Inc., we know it is truly representing the population of our country. Why don't we have any real black businesses that have succeeded? It's not because we don't have black business people. It's because we haven't supported them enough. Is, is that government's role, or can you encourage big business to, to help small businesses? That's all our roles, because it is about government making sure that money, rather than enriching individuals, should be in creating entrepreneurs. We've got to be more effective on that, and hopefully a focus on small and medium enterprise in a real way, giving money to the people who are entrepreneurs, giving money to people who are subsistence farmers and supporting them to become proper farmers by giving them access to skills, to to support in terms of building their own seed banks and being able to have water and electricity and irrigation, and then markets. The government can do a lot, but big business 
has to change how it works in South Africa. Our economy is still largely dominated by large companies. Even if you go into our townships, if you're looking for people to buy food, it's all brand names of big retail chains. It's not about entrepreneurs. You know, if I look at a lot of small black businesses, a lot of them don't get the tender because it goes to someone's pal who's is a friend of the councillor or the city manager or the, you know, the person running the local authority. We've got to address corruption. So there's many things we can do. We have to change our education system. So there are changes that all of us have to make. But I think in the new world that we are living, if we are training people or if we are saying we are going to create millions of jobs, it's lying. Because the only jobs that are going to come anywhere in the world is when you start to rethink the nature of work and train people to be able to be creative about how they use their skills. Fish for themselves. <clears throat> Thank you so much. This has been uh, fascinating. I wish we can continue such a big topic. And